is the Ember Saturday in Advent, in the third week of Advent, we'll be here again in New Hampshire. And we'll read, there's six epistles, but we'll read only just the one, the first lesson of only of this Mass. Others go from the book of Isaiah, chapter 19. In those days they shall cry to the Lord, because of the oppressor, and he shall send them a savior and a defender to deliver them. And the Lord shall be known by Egypt, and, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day, and shall worship him with sacrifices and offerings. And they shall make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord shall strike Egypt with a scourge, and shall heal it. And they shall return to the Lord, and he shall be pacified towards them, and the Lord our God shall heal them. So this passage of Isaiah refers to the, the time that we're in right now. And that is that, the uh, remember, all of history is contained in sacred scripture. All history is there. And that, uh, that part of history is the victory of the time of the Maccabees in the Old Testament. And Maccabees were living in a very wicked time. And that all the history is contained in sacred scripture, in the book of Revelation, the book of Apocalypse, properly called the book of Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, in which there is a, the revelations concerning all the history of the world from the last judgment, I mean from the uh, Pentecost Sunday until the day of the last judgment at the end of the world. And here it says that, 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 that Isaiah speaks about Egypt. Now Egypt, of course, is a country, it's a country in Africa, but here Egypt refers to only, Egypt is not only a country, but Egypt also signifies the land of sin. In fact, we learn that Satanism, the heart of Satanism, the essence of Satanism, comes specifically from the land of Egypt. And even in our times, all Satanists use Egyptian symbolism. Now there is Satanism in every false religion. And there are many people throughout the world that have worshipped Satan in every country, in every continent. But we find that whenever there is a real and deep Satanism, Always Egyptian symbolism is used. Always something from Egypt. Always, always, always. And so that the the the, father, the, the source of the satanic religion is from Egypt. From Egypt it spread throughout the entire world. So therefore when, when the scripture speaks of Egypt, it is not speaking only of that particular country, that particular land, that particular small country in Africa, the northern part of Africa, but rather it speaks of the land of sin, which can also apply to the whole world. When our times, and the, when the church turns, when people the church turn to sin, they become like Egypt. Also remember, even though our Lord Jesus Christ physically went into Egypt, it says in the sacred scripture, I have called my son out of Egypt. So that our Lord had to go to Egypt, to the place of the most, not just a wicked place, but the most wicked place on the earth. And then he was called from the land of Egypt, and he saved us from the sin that is found in Egypt. Here's when Isaiah speaks about Egypt here in Isaiah chapter 19. In those days they shall cry to the Lord because of the oppressor. The oppressor refers to the Antichrist, but also not only to the Antichrist, but to all wicked leaders. Because there, are, there have to be wicked leaders in each age, and the wicked leaders of our times, the oppressor. And he shall send them a savior and a defender to deliver them. And the Lord shall be known by Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. Now the Egyptians refer specifically to the people that are spreading evil throughout the world. Our Lady of Fatima said specifically who that is. She said that Russia will spread her errors throughout the world a hundred years ago. She said that in 1917. And now the, Russia has spread its errors throughout the world. And so Russia is the new Egypt. But what is going to happen? Not only will Egypt be defeated because sin is always defeated. So this doesn't refer to the universal defeat of sin but to a specific time in history that Isaiah is seeing in his vision. And so he says there's going to be a time of Egypt. In those days they shall cry to the Lord because of the oppressor, and he shall send them a savior and a defender to deliver them. And the Lord shall be known by Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. And Our Lady of Fatima says that when Russia is consecrated to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Russia is going to convert. What does that mean? Russia shall know the Lord that day. When we hear the word day, always refers to the victory of God, to the light, to something that's a more permanent victory, and also it comes also can be considered that it happens hastily, quickly. 
The conversion will happen quickly in one day. So in a very short period of time. There's going to be an oppressor. He shall send, but the God shall send them a savior and a defender to deliver them. And the Lord shall be known in, by Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day. And they shall worship him with sacrifices and offerings. And they shall make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord shall strike Egypt with a scourge and shall heal it. And that is called the chastisement. So remember, there's nothing new under the sun. This is where Isaiah lived 700 years, 800 years before Jesus Christ was born. He lived in the time before the great Babylonian captivity. And he referred, he said that this is, these days are going to come upon us. He knew the future. That there will be a scourge coming from Egypt. Because Egypt was used to punish the Jews because the Jews had turned against God. Therefore, they were brought into slavery into Egypt. They went into Egypt. They were brought into slavery. They were turned into slaves when they lived inside of Egypt. Then they had to escape Egypt. And they went out of Egypt. And the Egyptians were a threat unto them. But the Egyptians and their evil were destroyed. But, that, but the evil Egyptians. But Egypt itself shall be converted. And Egypt shall worship and offer true sacrifices. And that's what's going to happen next. And they shall make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord shall strike Egypt with a scourge, and he shall heal it. And they shall return to the Lord, and he shall be pacified towards them, and the Lord the God, our God shall heal them. And hence, we, when we look at all the prophecies of the present time that we're headed into, they are all universal. All of them say the same thing, whether it be the prophecy of Isaiah, the prophecy of St. John in the Apocalypse, the prophecy of our Lord himself in Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24, the prophecies of the saints down the last several hundred years all say the same thing. There will come a time of difficulty. There will come a time of trials. There will come a difficult time. But this time shall end in a day. And it is only a time of curing, scourging that we might be healed. Just as it says in the book of Proverbs, when a child is being bad, the child is not behaving as he should, the father spanks the child. But why does he spank the child? In order that the child might be corrected and live. The Lord does not wish the death of America. He doesn't wish the death of the modern church. He doesn't want the death of modern man. He wishes the curing and, and, and healing of us, and therefore he sends a scourge. We're now experiencing a phase of this scourge right now. And then, in a day, shall be the victory. So this is recorded in sacred scripture and in so many prophecies. So we've got to remember that while, as we enter the time of the scourge, we feel the pain. And we, we feel the pain of the scourge, and we, we are worried about the scourge, and worried about the scourge, and worried about the scourge, and we forget that this spanking, this scourging, this cleansing, this pain is for the purpose of healing. When you're going to do a surgery, you have to cut in order to go into the body. The cut causes a wound. Then we go in and remove the cancer, and remove the poisons, and remove the evil, and then the wound is sewed up, and the body heals. And this is what God is doing to our church, and oftentimes he does it to our souls, and to our country, and to our land. So we've got to remember that in this time of battle. And then also there's a few brief considerations concerning King David, who is the one who tells us how to act in the time of difficulty. The heart of David is the heart of the church. And notice all the behaviors of David. How did David prepare for battle? One thing we know concerning David's preparing for battle. Remember, his first great battle was against Goliath. He defeated Goliath in an instant. The battle lasted about less than one minute. That's how long the battle lasted. And, and Goliath was dead. He then, and then the, the Philistines were wiped out. But it was 40 days of taunting, 40 days of fear, 40 days of tribulation and shame for the Jewish army. And 40 days is a long time. But then at the end of the 40 days, a shepherd boy came and in one minute eliminated all the shame of Israel, brought in the glory of Israel, and defeated the enemies of God. How did David prepare for that great fight when he is a little boy with five polished stones and a script? And a, 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 a went and attacked David, and killed him with a sling, uh, knocked him out with a slingshot, and then killed David with his own sword. Notice that David, uh, that Goliath was killed with his own sword. Notice that as Goliath was killed with his own sword, we'll find modern man being killed by his own things. 
His, he, he's being killed by his own weapons that he's going to be using to try to destroy the church. Goliath was killed with his own sword, so it will be with modern man. How did David prepare for that fight? David was a shepherd. What did David do to prepare for the fight? Number one, he took care of the sheep. He stayed out of the sheep not only during his 9 to 5 job, he stayed with his sheep throughout the nights and throughout the days. So much so, he, so much time he spent with his sheep that when Samuel came to bless the sons of, 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 of Jesse, of Isai, when he came to bless his sons, he said, I gave you all my sons. These are all my six sons. But there was a seventh son who was David. And he was so much gone, so much with his sheep, that he was forgotten as a member of the household. So he worked with his sheep not only in the day, but in the night. Secondly, Isaiah was, I mean, uh, uh, David, when he was taking care of those sheep, he grew to love the sheep as his own. He loved them uh, with a great love, and he used to sing to the sheep. He took out his harp, he brought it into the fields where he watched the sheep, and he sang to them. And he sang his melodies, and he had poetry in his heart. And this is where his strength came from. David was most brave in battle. But where did that bravery come from? We can see that his bravery came from two sources. One, this bravery came from his grandmother and his great-grandmother. His grandmother was Ruth, and his great-grandmother was Rahab. And Rahab saved herself and all the people in her house in the city of Jericho. And, and Ruth was saved by, 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 by following Salome into, into a place where she could never thought there was any hope. She followed, your people are my people, thy people shall be my people, thy, thy land shall be my land, and thy God my God. Her husband had died. She had no children. And, and, and she, she went with her mother-in-law into a foreign land called Israel. And she had no connection with her, with her kinsfolk. But what did she do? I cannot leave my mother-in-law alone. I cannot leave her abandoned. And the spirit of the love of her, of her mother-in-law gave up her family. She gave up her family, she gave up her home, she gave up everything only to take care of a woman until she died. When she arrived, she would meet the grandfather of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the great-great-grandfather. She would be the great-grandfather of our Lord Jesus Christ. She would become the great-grandmother of the Savior of the world. She didn't know that. She didn't know she would be recorded in sacred scripture and have a whole book dedicated to her. She didn't know that. All she knew was she was going to follow and take care of, 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 of her mother-in-law, who was of a foreign land and of a foreign god. Thy people are going to be my people, my, thy god, my god. And that heart of, of Ruth entered into her grandson. She had many grandsons, at least six other ones. But the seventh one took on the heart of Ruth. That was David. Took on the heart of Rahab. And then when he was in the field taking care of the sheep, he sang. He sang beautiful melodies which are with us to this day, that are the melodies of the church. Singing is something that we must do as human beings and followers of God. And singing was the preparation of David for battle. It's not the normal way to prepare for battle. But he sang with all his heart. And he sang the melodies that were inside of his heart. He sang with the, the, the poetry. Of the, of, the, of the love and the strength of her grandmother, Ruth, and her great-grandmother, Rahab. His great-grandmother, Ruth and, Rah and, Ruth and Rahab. And, and that the heart of them was inside of him. And how mysterious it was if Rahab had not made the choice to guard those three spies, there would be no David. If Ruth had not given up everything to follow her mother-in-law, there would be no David. It was so delicate that if they had made the wrong choices a hundred years before he was born, there would be no David. And so he understood the greatness and importance of choices in the time of crisis, choices in the time of difficulty. And he sang about it, and he meditated on it, and he prayed about it. And then, while he was praying and singing one day, a lion came to kill his sheep. And without thinking, he rose up, and he attacked the lion with his bare hands, and he killed it. Another day, another day, a bear came and grabbed one of his sheep, and he pulled the, the sheep out of the claws and out of the mouth of the bear and saved his sheep and ran the bear away. And so that he was able to do these things. Why? Because of his heart and because what he did in his time with those sheep. 
We are now preparing for the great battle that's going to come. Goliath is against us, and there must be David. And there is going to be a war. The army was 40 days sitting on the hill. And what were they doing? Nothing. They were useless. Just like the modern conservatives, the modern conservatives, the modern politicians, the right-wing politicians, the Fox News garbage, the right-wing guys who are going to be standing for the truth, the ones that are for the conservative values and family values, they are like the army of Israel sitting on that hill for 40 days. And Goliath comes and says, send a real man down to fight me. And they are afraid. So what do they do? They talk about it. They have all kinds of talk radio. They have all kinds of talk communications. They have all kinds of mass media communications. They have all kinds of discussions about what should be done. But no man goes down to the battle because they believe if they go down to fight that giant, they will be defeated. When they don't realize that any one of those soldiers, not just David, any one of those soldiers, no matter which one it was, who would choose to go down to fight Goliath, could not lose. He could not be defeated because he fought with God and against the representative of Satan. And he thought the man was 10 feet tall. He was really strong. And we look at the world around us. We see that the Democrats are too strong. We see that the Bilderbergers are too strong. We see that, they, uh, that our enemies are too strong. And we know that God's going to win one day. Well, why don't we hang out in the camp and wait for some little boy to come in and take care of the problem? But the fact is, these 40 soldiers are not the warriors of God. They, well, any one of them could have defeated Goliath on the first day. But what was the problem? They were not taking care of sheep before they went to that battle. They, were not, they did not have song in their hearts before they went to that battle. And it was not a battle they expected. They thought it would be machine guns and cannons and swords. They didn't realize it was a battle of God versus Belial. And the battle of the heart of the man of God versus the heart, the proud heart, of the man of the devil. And how did we go into that fight? When David went into that fight, he knew what to say. He was very humble, so humble that he was not even recognized as one of the children of his own father. He worked the smallest tasks, but when it came to the day of battle, Goliath, big guy, the idiot that he was, he says, am I a dog? I am going to feed you to the birds. And David says, is that all? I am going to feed you and your entire army, all carcasses to the birds, and I am going to destroy you. David out trash talked David, Goliath. And David, without the slightest fear, he wouldn't have time for a long conversation. It was David that ran to the battle and not Goliath. He picked up his five stones. He took his script. He took his sling. And he ran with haste into the battle. And he said, you, you, I come with God, and you are of the devil, and I will destroy you. And so he did. And very quickly, one stone in the forehead, and Goliath was defeated. But how did this fight happen? Because of David's preparation. But then there will be other times when David has to fight. He fought against Goliath. He killed him in an instant. But then there would come the day when Saul would try to kill David. A little bit later, Saul would be so angry with David, so jealous of David, the King Saul, who was made king by God, and he would try to kill David. And what did the same David do? He fled. The same David ran away. Did he run away because he was a coward? Absolutely not. He ran away because he would not touch the anointed of God. And therefore, he ran away. He also showed his great bravery by going into the camp of King, of King Saul and picking up his sword in the middle of the night and carrying it away. And it was God who would take care of King Saul. David took care of Goliath. Sometimes he ran. Sometimes he fought. Sometimes he sang. One time when he was singing before Saul, the song so much disturbed Saul that Saul took a spear and tried to kill him while he was singing. And he fled. And so the fact is, why do we know what to do in a battle? Prepare like King David. Take care of the sheep. Take care of our daily responsibilities with all our hearts and go beyond the 9 to 5 job. Do greater the works of charity. Make sure the rosary is part of our daily life. And make sure that Christ is in our hearts always. And sing. 
We sing of the of the, uh, consider the, the 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 great acts of our ancestors, the great deeds of our the saints. Consider what what was in the heart of Saint Francis Xavier that made him travel the entire world. What was in the heart of Saint Simon the Stylite that made him stay on top of a pillar for forty years in one place? What was in the heart of Saint Anthony that made him run to the desert? What was in the heart of the other St. Anthony that made him preach and preach and preach greater than all the other preachers in the history of the world? What was in the heart of, 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 the, of the, each of the saints? St. John Bosco making them take care of children. What moved them? They sang the divine love and the divine truth in their hearts. And we have to learn how to do that. And then take care of the sheep, work in the night, and then when the day comes, the defeat of Goliath will happen in a very quick instant. It will be a day, and there shall be the victory of Mary. It will be a day, and there shall be the conversion of Egypt. But meanwhile, let us prepare as David prepared, and then we'll have victory as he had victory. And remember also, what about David when he did wrong? Because he sang, because he took care of the sheep, even when he committed the most grave of sins, he committed adultery, and a child out of wedlock. He murdered the husband of the, of, 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 of the innocent and good Urias. He was filled with a great pride, but because he had song in his heart, and because he took care of the sheep, what happened? His evil was very brief, his evil was very short, and he very quickly repented. And he very quickly came back to God. Whenever he was bad, it was for a brief time. When he was good, it was strong in his heart. So let us pray for the, for the, the heart of David to be in us, not only when we are doing well, but when also when we are doing badly. And these are the ways to prepare for battle. Lord, bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.